For those of you that have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn with me again to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're only going to call your attention to one verse, and that's Acts, chapter 2, verse 1. And it reads like this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord. From the power of grace divine, my soul looks up with a steadfast hope. And may my will be lost in thine. Take me out of myself. Use me as an instrument in your hand. And we should be mindful to give your name praise, glory, and honor. Because it all belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God. And I would like to use a subject coming from this particular passage of scripture. Being on one accord. Being on one accord. As believers, Christians, or followers of the way, we need to have a better understanding of what really happened on the day of Pentecost. Although we may never fully understand everything that happened, I believe that our response to Pentecost has to be greater than what it has been. As followers of the way, as Christians, as disciples of Christ, we celebrate the Christmas event because it is the marking of the coming of Jesus Christ, our Savior, into the world. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday because it marks the victory of our Lord Jesus from death, hell, and the grave. I would suggest to you that we celebrate Pentecost greatly because Pentecost is a time of the year or the time that the Holy Spirit came and gave power to the church to be the church that God has called the church to be. But because we have neglected the significance of what happened on Pentecost, we are undernourished, impoverished, Incomplete, uninformed, unequipped, ineffective, and with many respects unsatisfactory in our witnessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at and examine this Pentecost moment, it starts out as a feast day. It takes place roughly 50 days after the resurrection during biblical times. On this day, the Jewish people from all around Jerusalem will come to Jerusalem for the festival of weeks. They will come to celebrate the fact that God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. But Pentecost was also an agricultural significance in that the Israelites made an offering unto God as an expression of the gratitude for the harvest that they had just collected. Right. All right. Pentecost was nothing new. For Pentecost was the prophetic reality of Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, when the prophet Joel declared, and it shall come to pass, Afterwards, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see vision. Verse 29 says, and also 
upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days. I will pour out my spirit. In other words, Joel was saying there is a time coming where the spirit of God is going to be poured out upon all of them that are willing to receive and accept what God has for them. Pentecost was the gift that the exalted Christ Jesus gave the church. Although this was and still is a gift freely given to the church, the gift was only given under a certain circumstance. Like any good gift that's given by good parents or guardians, a gift that is valuable for the child in many cases, Although the parent wants to give the gift, but the parent sometimes holds back off the gift until they are certain the child is ready to receive that which God has for them. In other words, if you know your son or daughter is irresponsible, you're not going to give them that new car. <laughs> for you see, if you give the gift too soon, and the child is not mature enough to receive the gift. The gift then becomes misused, even abused. If the gift is given too soon, the gift that was intended for joy and to make life better in the hands of an immature child or an immature person, that gift can cause serious injuries. As we look at and examining the opening passage of the scripture, Acts 2, chapter verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were always one accord in one place. In other words, the promise that Jesus made over here in Acts 1 and 8, when he says, but ye shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be both witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. All right. The promise is given, but the promise has not manifested itself as of yet. Uh -huh. right. Because the promise has been given, and because the promise has not been manifested, don't think for one moment that the promise is not coming. It is not easy to be waiting on a promise. The promise does not come into reality until the disciples, the followers of the way, were in one place and were with one accord. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. That the promise was not given right. until the disciples were in one place with one accord. Well. It's not easy to be in one place because there was 12 disciples and remember it was not just the 12 but it was also an additional 120. So it's not easy to be in one place and on one call. For you see, there were external as well as internal forces that kept them from being on at least one call. Now, being on one call is not always easy. Being on one call is not always convenient. You just don't wake up one morning and find yourself being on one call. But to get to the place of being on one accord only happens after struggle and prayer with and for one another. Well, thank you, Lord. You know, help me, help me, help me. Well. For I said, with and for one another. 
the baby. It's not good enough for you to go home by yourself and pray. We are not suggesting that you ought not do that. We are suggesting that you should do that. But if you want to be on one accord, we have to change some of our structures and ways. Because if we're going to be on one accord, sometimes we need to come together corporately and pray. Amen. You need to be in prayer, holding hands on your knees next to the person that you are in odds with. I can just see in my mind that those disciples along with the 120 others we're not always in agreement with one another. I don't know. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but I can see in my baptized imagination, I can see them in meetings and in gatherings and sometimes not acting godly. Y'all don't know anything about that. I can see them allowing their tempers to flare. I can see them rather than being led and reasoned by the Holy Spirit, they were read and they were led by passion. Yeah. That sometimes can push you over the cliff. All right. I can see them pausing and bending down on their knees and praying together and worshiping and praising God together. I can see them crying and hugging each other because they began to understand that the forces of evil that were up against them kept them from being on one right. At the very beginning of the life of the early disciples of Jesus were, they were experiencing persecution. Often when we pray, we are asking God to remove us from the terrible situations. We are calling for God to take us out of harm's way. We are asking God to make things better. And if any of you are anything like me, sometimes in my prayer, I'm saying, God, do it and do it quick, fast, and in a hurry. Amen. I don't always want to go through yeah. all that God is calling me to go through yeah. to get to where God wants me to be. Yeah. Sometimes I'm trying to expedite my journey by saying, God, just move us along a little faster because. You know we can't take much more of this, but God has said, no, you got to go through the journey in order to get where I need you to be. And so as I think about that, then I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Rodney. Maybe there needs to be an adjustment in our prayers. Maybe just maybe not the prayers are so popular, but my prayers, maybe just maybe my prayers should not focus on the outward forces that are seeking to destroy us. But maybe, just maybe, our prayers ought to focus on the power of God that he has placed on the inside of us. Maybe, just maybe, I ought to get down on my knees and say the messed up church that I'm in has nothing to do with anybody else but me. And then sometimes I have to pause and ask myself the question if every member in the church was a member like me, what kind of church would my church be? We need to focus. Rather than praying for the outward to change, maybe we need to pray that God changes us so that we can be on one accord. I'm just going to use Mary Lou's name because I know she's not going to get mad. <laughs> But if Mary Lou and I are at odds, I need not pray that God get her right. Maybe she's right and I'm the wrong that needs to get right. I'm just saying. Because our prayers cannot always be based on what someone else is or what someone else is not doing. But our prayers need to be based on the fact that it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Maybe our 
prayer should be that God will first reconcile us with one another. Yes. In order for us to become on one accord. Because if we are not on one accord, we don't have the power or the spiritual authority to reconcile anybody else to Christ Jesus when we are not reconciled to ourselves. Yes. We need to pray that according to the riches of his glory that God regret that we are strengthened in our inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. In order for us to get on one accord, we must pray that I might my, 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 not be my brother, but it's me, God, and that you ground me and keep me rooted in your love. We need to do everything that we do out of the center of love. Amen. If we can't do it because love is motivating us to do it, then we ought not do it just for the sake of doing it. We ought to do it because of love. Yes. If we want to be on one accord, we need to continue to pray that each of us will have the power of God working within us, each of us, so that we might be able to accomplish the abundantly far more than we can ask or even imagine if we tried it by ourselves. Although, although the Holy Spirit is already with us, the Holy Spirit will not manifest Himself in our presence in a mighty way until we get on one accord. On the day of Pentecost, we can experience the joy and the power of being a part of the universal family of God. And God's goal is that we will become active contributors in a local family called the church. But in order for that to happen, again, I hate to keep repeating myself, but we have to be on one accord. In other words, if we're not on one accord, we cannot expect to do a major work for the Lord. In order for us to have an authentic relationship with the church, we have to be open and we have to be on one accord. And we have to understand the relationship between the church and the kingdom of God. And it's only when we are on one accord that we can stop doing church and learn how to be the church. Some of us are experts on doing church. We have the church language down pat. We know how to say hallelujah. We know how to say mind of God and woman of God, but we don't know how to love each other. And so we don't want to call and learn how to love each other. But this all men will know what? That ye are what? My disciples. When we are on one accord and connected by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can then focus both on the kingdom of God and on the church because of the interconnection of the Holy Spirit that brings the kingdom and the church together. When we are on one accord and then and only then check this out, will God trust us enough to carry out God's agenda through the church? Let's, let's, let's examine that. In order for God to give us the divine assignment, in order for God to give us what he needs for us to have, God has to trust us. Amen. And the question I want us to raise within our own individual self, does God trust us enough to assign to us difficult assignments that can change the lives of folks? And if God does not trust us enough, there's nothing wrong with God and his trust. It's because God has watched us. He has looked at our track record, and our track record says not trustworthy. And when you are a child of God, and in God's mind you are not trustworthy, then you're like the fig tree bearing no fruit that needs to be cast off. So we need to pray that we never get to the point where God says, I don't trust you. There are churches all across this nation with large memberships and small memberships that God does not trust to carry out his kingdom agenda. Don't look at the, at the size of the church and draw the conclusion of whether or not they are a kingdom agenda church. But it is the kingdom of God that carries out the agenda of God through the church when the church is again on one accord. I'm trying to stay away from that word, but I just have to keep on talking about that word. One accord. It's time that we become the kingdom people that are on one accord, representing something bigger than our only individualized groups, 
our own preferences and our own agendas, desires, and wants. But yet and still, we need to get the same spirit that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane that said, nevertheless, not that my will, but let thy will be done. Until we can allow our wills to get out of the way, we will never walk on one accord, and God will never use us in the manner or in the fashion that God is called to use us. But when we get on one accord, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has those that love him. Yes. 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 Now once we are on one accord filled with the Holy Ghost, we yes. understand and embrace the fact that the kingdom agenda for the church is that we become God's instrument mm -hmm. All right. to win those that are lost, yes. to nurture those that are found, to transform the kingdoms of this world into the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Mm -hmm. My brothers and my sisters, once we Get on one accord. No other entity has been assigned the awesome function of the work of God in the world. It is the church that Jesus alone is building up the foundation of relationship. Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when we ask the church, the body of believers, the followers of the way, disciples of Christ, are on one accord and operating the Jesus agenda, we can say with new meaning the words of the song when Jesus, the words of Jesus when he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When the church carries out the Jesus agenda because we are on one accord, we can walk in the reality of the promises of Jesus and that is the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice the promise does not say that the gates of hell won't come against us, but the promise says they shall not prevail. The gates of hell might be like prevail temporarily on your job. The gates of hell might temporarily prevail in your family, but the gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not, and shall not prevail against the church. In other words, if the church is going to have an impact, we must be on one accord. In which is as it means that the church is going to have to have unity. Right. When talking about unity based on being on one accord, we are not talking about uniformity. Uniformity is having the same form of the same shape. It is looking the same. Rather, when you're walking and working in one accord, you are talking about oneness of being, oneness of believing, and a oneness of belonging. And we can have this oneness and be different. I don't have to look like you. I don't have to act like you. I don't have to praise God like you. I don't have to worship like you. But I can be the same in the kingdom as you and still be as different from you as we are outside of the kingdom. But we are all one body and we have the same spirit, which is the Holy Spirit of God, which we received on when? The day of Pentecost. Yes. We have one Lord who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one faith that salvation comes through confessions of Christ as one Savior and receiving Christ as one Lord. We have one baptism of the Holy Ghost into the life and power of victory and in joy. We are on one accord and we have one God and one Father who is in us all, with us all, and working through us all. We are to be compete to be on one accord with one another. And when we are on one accord with one another, the Holy Ghost unites men and women into a new body that's called the church. And we can function in the spirit of oneness on the day of Pentecost. When the disciples with one accord, the Holy Ghost filled the room. They received power from God. So I'm going to ask you to please pardon me just for a minute as I pause to pray in the midst of this sermon. Oh God, please help us to get on one accord. And once we get on one accord, we ask that you fill the room. Fill the room with the spirit of oneness. Fill the room that we'll be able to walk right and talk right. Fill the room with love, joy, and peace. Fill the room that we'll be able to walk out and live out the mandate, the ministry, and the mission of the church to demonstrate the unbound, unrestricted, unconditional love and love for the body of believers and love for everybody in the entire family. Because the early church was on one accord. Their love for humanity was amazing. One of the church fathers wrote and said that all you have to do is look at how 
the heathens talked about them and how the heathens in the sand by the love they love one another. When you are one or one, one accord and filled with the Holy Spirit, yeah. the church will make the world take notice. Right. Y'all don't believe me this morning, but in the words of that song, Bert Dion Wark, she said, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just I know y'all know that song. If there is a group of people that ought to realize that the world is in need of love, it ought to be the church. In this day when people are dying, people are starving for love, the local church ought to be the main distributors of love within our cities and within our country. Love is not optional, rather love is the absolute source and law of all faith. Love is the essence of our being. Love is the motivation of our behavior. Love is the model of our dear love. 